Hello, and I hope today finds you um, relaxed and ready to learn some of the introductory material about the respiratory system. In these recordings, we're going to cover materials from slides 1 through 13. This is background information for many of you that's been covered fairly recently in your anatomy and physiology classes and of course can always be uh, clarified in class uh, with me when we meet next week. So let's start by talking about the structure and function of the respiratory system. And as an overview, we'll remember that the purpose of the respiratory system is to allow for the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide down at the alveolar level. The upper respiratory system com is comprised, as you see in this illustration, of the structures of the nares. The nares are the nasal passages. Within the nares, there are protrusions that are called turbinates, and they line the wall of the, of the nasal passage, increasing the surface area so that when we are inhaling air that may have pollutants in it, it will uh, collect on the lining of the nasal passage and hopefully not get down any lower in our airway. There are also small hairs off of these turbinates and those hairs act as a collecting system as well as a filter. The septum separates the right nostril or nares from the left. The septum should be intact as a solid wall to protect the left from the right and vice versa. We have nasal sinuses, which you'll see in the next slide, called the frontal, ethmoid, sphenoid, and maxillary sinuses that are located on our face, behind our forehead, and behind our cheeks. These sinuses are usually air-filled and um, do not contain liquids. They, do, they are lined with mucus but they do not uh, contain fluids. The pharynx, as you see, is the back of the throat or the back of the mouth, and it's comprised of three segments, the nasopharynx, lower the oropharynx, and even lower the laryngopharynx, just above the epiglottis in the area of the larynx, where our voice box is. The epiglottis is a structure that covers the larynx that prevents aspiration, and it's a flap that covers over the trachea. The trachea lies below the epiglottis and is a 10 to 12 centimeter long tubular structure. And as you can see, the trachea is covered with cartilage, and so it is a firm structure and um, very strong. As you see at the bottom of the trachea, the right and left main stem bronchi separate or bifurcate. And that sensitive area that's straight down the trachea where the two separate is called the carina. And this is a very sensitive area. So if we were to suction our patient with a, a nasotracheal suction or, or through a tracheostomy tube, and we were to stick the catheter down, we, would, we will stimulate the carina and the patient will cough. Here is the picture of the nasal sinuses. The frontal sinuses are behind our forehead. The ethmoidal sinuses are straight back uh, th past the bridge of our nose between our eyes. The sphenoid sinus is behind that and the maxillary sinuses are found behind our cheeks. And we'll talk about sinusitis later in class, and we'll talk about the signs and symptoms, which of course many of you know are pressure in these areas. The lower respiratory tract is found below the carina, and it is uh, identified by the right and, main, right and left main stem bronchi, as well as the 
bronchioles that lead to the alveoli and the alveolar sacs. Um, we will talk in depth about these structures in a moment. Just one point to bring out uh, from the previous illustration, which you'll find in your textbook, is that the, the right main stem bronchi is shorter, wider, and straighter down than the left. The left is angled up a bit, and this will come into play when we talk about the which lung is more at risk for aspiration of food into it and as well as um, aspiration of the tuberculosis bacteria. And that would be the right upper and middle lobes because the right main stem bronchi is shorter and wider and therefore organisms as well as food particles go straight down into it um, more readily. We're also gonna remember that the right lung is separated into three lobes where the left lung is separated only into two lobes. So when we talk about the respiratory bronchioles, we're going to start with this illustration at the right here, which I think does a great job of showing the various levels of our lower respiratory tract. So the trachea is the upper respiratory system and the uh, where it separates and to the right is the lower respiratory system. And so when we separate out the problems of the respiratory system into upper and lower uh, respiratory system. And you can see it just continues to separate and bifurcate and branch off uh, the bronchiole and the sub sub bronchiole. You don't need to know those terms so much, just bronchioles. Then we have the uh, level of the bronchioles where we have the non-respiratory level, meaning that no diffusion of oxygen takes place. So above the respiratory bronchioles, no diffusion of oxygen takes place. And you can see that's kind of per, uh, pinker in color. From the bronchioles down to the alveolar ducts and alveoli, that is anatomically active and diffusion of oxygen and carbon dioxide are taking place. The um, normal tidal volume of an inspiration and an expiration, sort of an at rest, breathe in and breathe out, is about 500 milliliters for the average adult. Of that, about 150 mil milliliters of volume remains in the anatomic dead space. So there's a lot of space in the respiratory tree where no diffusion is taking place. This structure here, any of this circulation at the capillary level around the alveoli will, of course, affect diffusion. I do have in the illustration here then as well, you can see the layer of surfactant that is inside the alveolar uh, space and right lines the alveoli on the inside. Surfactant is a sub substance that lowers the surface tension uh, to decrease the amount of pressure needed to inflate the alveoli. And you'll hear about the importance of surfactant in especially in the neonate. When adults take a sigh breath, we stimulate the production of surfactant. And so the, um, once you get into your ICU rotation, you'll see that not only do we have normal respirations, uh, maybe 12 breaths per minute or 14 breaths per minute, but there'll be sigh breaths that are built into the respiratory cycle on a patient who is completely ventilator dependent to include these sighs so that they overextend their alveoli, stimulating the production of surfactant. Isn't that interesting? So here we have a picture of the normal alveoli at the top and it's very thin walls and the open lumen and um, the little arrow there is po pointing to a connection pore called the pore of cone where two alveoli or three are connected. And these structures actually allow for the movement of bacteria as well, good bacteria as well as bad bacteria um, from one alveoli to the other. 
and we'll talk about uh, the respiratory defense mechanisms that include good bacteria that reside in our alveoli to uh, be ready to gobble up any of the bad ones that might come down and get that far down. And abnormal alveoli, as you can see on the bottom here, are very crushed. And this is an image of atelectasis, where the patient is not breathing deeply enough and they are not expanding their alveoli. Perhaps they're in bed, lying um, flat in bed, and they are not allowing gravity to help them expand their lungs, or perhaps they're having pain and they're not expanding their lungs uh, well due to pain. So many causes of, of uh, atelectasis exist.